Today we have a really special guest, Nilio Leone. Uh, Nilio is the chief executive and co-founder of Urban Monks, uh, a marketing agency based in Dubai that offers uh, growth as a service and funnel um, and full funnel solutions to some of the most promising startups in the MENA region. Um, Nilio has an incredible background in CV. Most notably, he was the central marketing director at Kareem uh, and played a pivotal role in their growth and subsequent acquisition by Uber. Uh, and then uh, he moved on as director of growth uh, for Washman, the region's leading laundry tech startup, where he has spearheaded the digital growth and customer acquisitions. Um, uh, prior to that, he held many senior roles within marketing at L'Oreal and Chanel uh, and is now a contributor to Entrepreneur Magazine and also uh, a growth mentor at Techstars. So thank you very much for joining us, Nilio. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited about this. Excellent. Well, look, uh, Nilio, I wanted to dive right in. And what we wanted just to really explore today is the topic around how digital marketing really equals growth. Um, so if I were to go into sort of my first question, I, I'd love to ask you a question around how did digital marketing play such a critical role in the success of Kareem, uh, where obviously you spent some time. What were the key elements of success and what really made that key difference to help Kareem take off? So um, I can tell you straight away, when I first joined Kareem, we were just eight people, like probably less than, than 30 people um, in a very small and crammed office. And we've tried everything, literally everything. Um, I remember back then, Tarek um, asked me to join the company with the, also I had like an interview to, uh, with, the, with the founders, Mudasser and, uh, and, and Magnus to join the company and really help them um, do marketing. And back then doing marketing was not something really clear. Why? Because we, at least here in the region, we didn't really have like a lot of uh, proven playbooks and all the marketeers, at least most of the marketeers that, that joined the company were all like myself coming from a traditional marketing background. And so we tried everything. We tried flyers, we tried um, activations, we tried pretty much everything, but nothing was really moving the needle. And then we started to see like a massive, massive change when um, we started building a whole digital marketing arm within the marketing team, within the central marketing team. And that's when Rakesh, um, he joined, I think he was at uh, Namshi before, and he joined the company. And that's really when we started seeing the, the like, you know, the, 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 the incredible growth and the incredible impact on signups. And that is where we really saw the pivotal moment. And it was really funny because back then, again, we were, we didn't really know much about digital marketing. It was really more understanding all the process. And this is what I actually did, at least for myself. I had to fine tune everything I had learned in those previous roles that I had in corporate, in big corporate companies in the headquarters of uh, L'Oreal in Paris and in the headquarters of Chanel back here in sort of like these battle tested in the trenches of these like startups. And I had to learn all these different skills that were not applicable in a corporate environment. And um, so, yeah, so that's when we really saw a pivotal role um, when, it, when it came to Karim. But most than just the digital aspect, I think Karim, Karim had one big um, aspect that needed to be optimized and fixed, which was branding. And that's why from day one, since I came from very strong brands like Chanel and L'Oreal, and especially in the headquarters where even if you don't speak on brand, they, like it becomes super, uh, super, super problematic. Even if your PowerPoint presentations are not done in brand, you get those kind of comments. Yeah. The first thing I realized is that Karim had already a product, like a strong product market fit. So the product was good enough to get shipped. The only problem is that this internal story that made all of us either consultants from major consulting groups like McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, and all of that, or big corporates like myself, leave our uh, corporate job to join a startup was not reflected in the story that we were telling our customers. So some of the early adopters could actually feel that energy, but most of the market as a consumer brand, the consumer out there in Dubai, in Egypt, in Saudi, would not really associate Karim with that amazing story that um, uh, Magnus and Mudasser were actually telling their own 
uh, recruits and the people that they employed. And that's where I saw the disconnect is that we were well aware of what we were building, but the customers out there were not aware at all. I'll just give you a very concrete example. When I first joined, I got back from the interview first with Tarek, then with the, with the, with the, with the Mudaster. I got back so excited because I really felt I was going to be part of something great. When I met Mudaster in that really cramped office, I still remember that he was mentioning we are going to build the PayPal mafia of the Middle East. We're going to call it the Karim mafia. You are going to be an early, um, an early uh, stage uh, employee. That means that you're going to have equity. And so one day, that equity, you'll be able to build a business. Now, <laughs> and with that equity, one day, everyone in this company will be able to build, to build the new business. So we are the fountain of entrepreneurship in this region. We are a positive message. We are the shining light of this region. I came back literally with goosebumps. And I told my wife, I'm leaving L'Oreal tomorrow and I'm joining this, this like random startup because this is going places. But then once I joined and I started, you know, asking around, like, you know, from, you know, friends and whatever out there, you know, Karim, and they were like, oh yeah, it's like Uber, right? It's like the, it's like, you know, it's like sort of quote unquote, the poor cousin of Uber. And I was like, man, this is crazy. Even branding agency, because that is like part of my mandate was like, okay, let's rebrand this company. I started interviewing in branding agencies and most of the branding agencies out there would actually turn us down saying like, uh, yeah, but your brand, you know, it's like you guys are, you know, like, uh. and then once we explained the story, the most edgy agencies and the most edgy and the edgiest creative directors really wanted to work with us because they understood the power of it. So I think there was a really misalignment of storytelling. And I believe, I personally believe then this like really states to me that the key element that made Karim success, it's brand. It's a marketing machine. We never had a better product than Uber. We share the same drivers in most of the countries we operate in. We share the same fleet in the same countries we operate in. Our product could not rival the pro like our product that was engineered by Bob and another couple of guys uh, in the tech team was not able to compete with a product built by a Silicon Valley, a thousand engineers uh, backed by super strong VCs. Like we could not rival on a product level. The only thing that we could rival on was the story. And that is, I believe that really made a difference. And as a matter of fact, when I thought about it, when Uber acquired Kareem for $3 billion, they never changed the brand. They kept Kareem as a brand. Yeah. And that's obviously a testament to how strong that branding was. Um, no, that's, that's really interesting that you say that. I think that ties really well to sort of like my, my next question, which is, it's, you know, this, the part of that storytelling is to also convey that story to your customer. And, but the way to kind of, I guess, to touch on some of those emotional points and get the most out of your customers, really to, I guess, get under the skin of that customer and understand, um, you know, what makes that customer tick. I guess how... How did that tactic help you at Kareem, for instance, where, you know, understanding your customer in a, in a deep way and, and getting under the skin of that customer, how did that support you guys at Kareem to actually achieve that success? So there's actually two sides of this question. The first sign is basically when you're talking about the tactic on how to get under the skin, then you're talking about one side of the story, which is distribution. Digital marketing and digital is a distribution channel. Digital itself will not do much if you don't do the other side of the story, which is understanding the customer, crafting a compelling message, and getting under their skin. We could have gotten under the skins of customers as well with flyers. The only problem is that flyers is not an accurate distribution channel. Why? Because you cannot reach the same amount of people at the same time, at the right time, at the right, on the right moment that you could with digital. Why? Simply because with digital, with a handheld iPhone, it's always with you. So that's what I was telling. Like some people come, like think that digitalizing is the one size fit all solution. Digital is just a tool. What really, a tool for distribution. What really matters, the other side of the story, the 80% of work that really is the hidden side of the iceberg, it's all that deep work on understanding customers. 
customers hold the key of your growth, not you, not the company. It's your customers. And we've done such a great job at understanding customers that we would get systematically under their skin, whether it was with digital, whether it was with activation, whether it was with an event, whatever that would be, we were very good at understanding customers much better than Uber. So what happened as a result, people felt that Kareem was a, had more quote unquote proximity versus Uber. And that's how we won Uber at its own game. Because let's be honest, ride hailing on an on a, on a iPhone or on an Android, whatever, on a, on, a, on a mobile, it's been created by Uber and by, by Lyft. The only way we, we could beat them was to customize and tailor our marketing message and our quote unquote product to the region in a way that customers would be closer to our brand than they were, would be with Uber that could not adapt so much because they had international guidelines. So how did you get under the skin of your customer within this MENA region accurately? There are three different elements. The first one, just keep in mind that all the early joiners like myself, we all had to go through customer service calls at least for two weeks prior starting our job. So what happened is that since the beginning, we really understood the customer really well. I still remember there was back then the GM of, uh, of UAE that basically he would start taking the, call, the phone and start calling customers saying, hey, today it's Sunday. We just saw that you're coming back from your holiday uh, from the airport. I just want to tell you, my name is Baba Ba. I'm the GM of Baba Ba, and this ride is for free. Thank you very much for using Kareem and for supporting your local entrepreneurs. Boom. And we would make these calls like this. So there was like this element of, and I think it was really one of the, of the core values of Kareem. I think it was wow. So you always need to wow your customers. And the only way to wow your customer, to wow anyone, is to understand what they want and then exceed their expectation. And it's the same with probably your wife or your girlfriend. Once you want to wow her, you're going to bring her to not a nice dinner. You're going to bring her to a wonderful dinner. Uh, you're not going to bring her one, like, you know, um, I don't know, uh, like a plant. You're going to bring, bring her a bouquet of, of roses. We were able to do that customization really, and especially in the early stage, we really became black belt at customizing our speech, at customizing our initiatives, at customizing our approach to customers. The second aspect was selecting talents that would really understand the cities. When they were selecting, for instance, and so it's recruiting, recruiting the right people to build the right team. When they were recruiting the uh, general manager of, let's say, Riyadh, they were really sure that that person would understand two things. They were internationally exposed, so they would have either studied somewhere international, they would have like that really modern kind of like really modern. They have this really nice guy's feeling like doing something impactful, meaningful, et cetera. And they would know their cities by heart, like the local culture. They would know it like, like no others. So they would know like where people would hang out. They would know the slang they would know. And so we injected that into our marketing material. So now imagine compare uh, Uber um, communication that is say, Hey, Nelio, uh, thank you very much um whatever like you know um get a car in five minutes um whatever like a guy in, in san francisco would talk to you and this would talk to saudi versus another guy like muaz from saudi arabia that was like managing Riyadh. that was like uh, uh, hala hala i don't know whatever and it's just like you know a lot of um a lot of arabic customization and the way they were speaking and the way and the cultural references and the pop cultural um you know uh, links they would do to their communication. This made a huge difference. And then the third aspect, the third aspect was engineering this as a systematic approach so that it was not just like one off, one off, one off, but then how do we systemize this approach and how do we consistently create stunts that are PR worthy? Mm. We made such strong PR statements. So like, and that goes back again to another core value of Kareem, which was be bold. It was really like being super bold. We launched, um, I think at some point, we launched like an initiative to um, 
for women, for Women's Day in Saudi, we launched an initiative so that all women uh, could ride for either preferential rate or for free. I, I don't remember the mechanics, but it, it has such a huge impact that even the um, even like a major uh, international paper in the states publicated this as like local startup is helping uh, Saudi women, um, la la whatever. So that is you know the kind of boldness that we needed. And that is the kind of boldness that made our marketing stunts very successful. So these are the three things. So it's as in the first two points seem very, very focused on customization. As in, you know, whether it's the person that you get on, obviously hiring the talent is critical to the success of any startup. But it's that second piece within that, which is still understanding your market, being able to talk to your customer in their languages is what differentiated you guys from being, you know, from competing against the big unicorn from Silicon Valley that had the engineers, that had the money to spend and the power of spend, but you guys were able to kind of really eke out that, I guess, connect with your users a lot more than, than, a, than an Uber, for instance. Yeah, and again, there were no like super hidden frameworks or a super complicated analysis that we would do, especially at the beginning. Like, you know, there was nothing like this. It was really, it was really getting, um, I think it was a, was a factor of getting the right people on board that could make those local um, references packaged in a way that it was very modern and cool. Um, no, brilliant. Look, that takes us to, I guess, to our next question. I think, um, obviously, Kareem wasn't just your career. I think subsequently after that, you went to uh, Washman. Um, which is a very different sector. Um, a lot of young people and a lot of our, of our users on our platform, for instance, talk about they put a lot of pressure on themselves about the businesses or sectors that they should work in from the start. And they feel that if they typically walk into a sector, that they'll end up in that sector for life. Um, now, from Uber to going into Washman and laundry, which isn't probably considered the most sexy or the attractive sector. Now, I guess, how did you make that decision to work for Washman? What attracted you to that business? And I guess, the other question here is, how should a budding marketer identify what is the right role or environment for them? So, actually, let me take a step backwards. Because before, between Karim and Washman, um, it was, so I had this, uh, this period of time where all these questions were very, like the same questions that probably um, people that are listening to this right now are asking themselves. This was the moment where I asked myself all these questions. So after Karim, after being central marketing director at Karim, I have this sort of like midlife crisis or whatever you want to call it, which why? Because I came from corporate. I was very successful in corporate. I had a pretty fast career. Then I went in a small startup that scaled massively. Um, and okay, then what do you do next? Should I go back to corporate and get back to that life? But after witnessing such an explosive growth and building a unicorn is something that happens once in not even a lifetime. Probably it happens once every two or three generations. So I have this, these two things of like any job that I will take from now on, how will that be exciting for me? Mm -hmm. I couldn't stay at Karim anymore because Karim grew into, um, grew from like this stellar startup unicorn and then like every business, it starts consolidating and it starts becoming like any other corporate or any other, any other, uh, any other big company. So it was not that, so it still had like a very strong imprinting of startup of, but it was not that we were not building another unicorn within Karim. It was just basically then optimizing. And so we were not on launching phase. We we're more like on cruising phase or just like to grow some elements of it, but it was not taking a baby taking a newborn and building into a unicorn. So for me, staying at Karim was not an option. Going back to corporate after what I witnessed was like, oh my God, kill me. Not because corporate is not exciting, not necessarily, but because after such freedom and experience, it's very hard coming back to like, you know, a job that, you know, like a normal job that requires like 95 and that requires... Um, very specific communication channels, very structured. Going to a new startup, especially here in the region, I couldn't see any other startup that could rival the excitement of, uh, of, of Karim. So any other startup would actually be like, 
nice, but it's not that. So it was horrible. I, so I stayed there for like, I started staring a wall for three days after I, I, I realized that Karim was not the place for me anymore. And then I was like, what am I going to do now? And funny enough, I started to get targeted on, on Facebook about all these guys living in Thailand or Bali, building uh, remote businesses um, without venture capitalists, without local teams, without an office. And they would build multi-million dollar businesses based on one book called The Four Hours Work, uh, work Week from Tim Ferriss. I, I, I devoured that book. I kind of like read it in like very short amount of time. And then I booked a ticket to Bali. I found a, um, back then a, a, like a sort of a conference of three days. And I went there because I wanted to reverse engineer how these people build million dollar businesses without employees, without venture capitalists, without initial funding. How do they do that? And so I started studying them for, and it actually lasted for two years where I pick different jobs and helping like consulting, freelancing, whatnot, to just tweak my skills to be able to understand and build these type of businesses myself. Super lean, super asset light on a, on a test, measure, uh, test fail measure. And that's what I did for two years. I, I saw incredible humans and sometimes extremely young as well, building e-commerce stores, that went like six figures, uh, building online agencies that were then um, generating, again, thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And I was like, man, how is this even possible? And that's when I get really interested in e-commerce flipping. So e-commerce flipping, what we started doing with a, uh, as, a small, as a small agency, we started buying, getting e-commerce stores that would get you uh, to a certain level of sales. But if you start an e-commerce store and probably you had a kid, you can't continue working on it. So what you do, either you shut it down or you sell it. We bought these e-commerce stores and just like flipping apartment, we would revamp all the user experience, pretty much the same um, type of work that now we're doing with, with, with clients. But like we would revamp their, their frameworks, their acquisition strategy, revamp everything, bring it to a significant amount of sales, and then we would resell it for like 10x. This really made me understand, and we used to do that all remotely. So I was I went there like in Bali, then I went to Chiang Mai, then I was here in Dubai. I did like this. Then I went back to Italy, still managing these kind of freelance, like, you know, freelance versus agency flipping gigs. And this is, I understood the power of it. Not only the power, but I built such a strong network of super good professionals in each field but then this thing started sticking with me. And when I, when I uh, had to come back to Dubai, because, um, you know, for personal reason, at a certain point, my wife was like, man, you're traveling all the time. What's going on? Like, it started to become uh, really difficult on a personal level. Then I, then I came back here to Dubai and my friends at Washman, Rami and Jab, was like, man, are you looking for a, for a position? Join us as a head of growth. We really need to, like, help us out. And you can help us out the time you like, the time we just, like, you know, build the engine then, you know, it's up to you if you want to stay or not. And plus, you know, we can have like, you know, equity deals or whatever. So, you know, that your time is well spent since you're still figuring things out or still you're freelancing or whatever. And this is what I did. So I joined as head of growth and man, I, we built, like we grew that company by seven X in 14 months, just me and an intern banking on that location independent um, frameworks that that we had built for uh, internally and so that is how the washman adventure was really significant to me because it was the moment where i kind of structured all the learnings at karim then all the learnings through digital nomads and then i structured them into like a business and that gave me the confidence to say man give me any business and i can give you growth no that's awesome i had no idea about the, the bali and uh, the Chiang Mai trips um, no, excellent. I th look, I think that's that's really interesting. I said from what you've said, it's it seems like the the status quo or working for sort of a nine to five business isn't isn't always. Uh, I, I guess it's not for you now. You've done it before, and now you realise that you you enjoy the independence. You enjoy that level of, I, I guess, working in your own time and, and and doing things how you see fit. Um, for a young 
I guess for a young marketeer, I guess what, what considerations do you think, or I guess what are the critical differences, say for working, between a, working for a startup versus a well-established you know, traditional organization? What are the critical differences? Um, and what should they think about for themselves? What should they keep in mind when starting at or applying for a digital marketing position at a startup, for instance? So there's two there's two two way of answering the question. So there's two answers to it. So a corporate or an established company gives you frameworks, gives you processes. So at the beginning, let's say if you don't know how to make make fire, they're gonna teach you. Hey man, in order to make fire, you need a stone. You need another stone. You need to do this. So step one, step two, step three. And then step four, and then you got fire. In a startup, someone will just come and say, man, we need a fire. And then it's you. It's up to you to figure out how you're going to do it. And so, you know, some, most of, uh, like, then it really depends on your personality. Some people really need processes. We need a structure, need a framework to start with. They cannot start on a blank canvas, especially when you're a junior, especially when you're, like, just coming out from school, you don't know anything about anything. So if you are a person that needs guidance and this only you can know it, if you know, if you need guidance, then you need to go into a more structured establishment in the hope, in the hope that your manager will give you training because it's not something systematic. It doesn't mean that if you go into a corporate, you will systematically get trained or systematically get exposed to process. It all depends on the team and on the manager that you get. So if you need more guidance, then what I would advise you is don't choose necessarily the company. Don't choose necessarily the job itself. Choose the manager you want to work with. The person that you see yourself in some years or the person that you think can teach you a lot and that actually will teach you a lot. So before accepting any sort of job, do an extremely detailed due diligence on the person you are going to work with in a corporate environment. Why? Because that person will be extremely, extremely important in the way you're going to develop. If you have a manager that doesn't have time, that doesn't want to focus on you, that you know all he cares is that you deliver your work and then he does his own career, then you know you're not gonna get a lot, even if you go in in a in an amazing company like let's say, I don't know, Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. And then if you go in a smaller structure, but with a manager that is gonna teach you everything and eager, every little step, then it's better like a smaller company. So really more choose the manager versus the job or the company. This is like the best advice anyone had given me in the past. And every time I focus on this, I stick to this very simple rule. I always got myself in the best positions possible to grow your, to grow your career faster. If you don't need guidance, that you're a guy that, I don't know, you're used to figure things out by yourself. Meaning you go to blogs, you read, you figure out, you study up until like, so you put 10 times the effort because you need to self-instruct yourself if you are a self-taught individual or a person that is able to do this kind of self-teaching process, then go to a startup because then you'll be super comfortable and you're going to love it. You're going to love the process of, of studying the problem and coming up with a framework. And you're going to learn things 10 times faster because startups are white canvases. So you can really customize and you can really model and shape that specific thing that you're building in the way that you want. No, that makes perfect sense. And to be fair, I think it's always something I've always said, follow the man, not the job. So that's uh, it. I completely agree. Um, as you, we, you spoke just a minute ago um, about if you're somebody who's a self learner and someone who actually, you know, who's quite inquisitive and that does their own research. Now, um, there's in, in the world of digital marketing, things change on a daily basis and technology is such a huge part of that. Um, what tools do you regularly use to, and how do you keep yourself upskilled and how would you recommend a young graduate or a young marketer to do the same? 
So there's two different things that you can do. First of all, uh, you can, um, so there's, there's theoretical knowledge and then there's practical knowledge. Theoretical knowledge, you can get it from books, certification, courses, um, and, and mentors. These are the three things. You need to pay for it. That's the only problem. And then you need to apply those things. So you need to experience. But if I could give you an advice and resources that you need to learn, I personally, for instance, invest a significant amount of, um, uh, of money in education. I always go through certifications. I always go through a learning process. I have blocked every day in my calendar two hours to learn something. And I, and I organize this in sprints. So the sprint, for instance, of, of these six months was to learn extremely well marketing analytics. I've been taking the most expensive certification out there for marketing analytics, and I'm still involved right now because it's so hard that I've gone through the test already twice and didn't manage to make it yet. So I'm not going to ditch it until I get that certification. And so something that, you know, maybe I thought it was like on a three months basis. Now it's extended to a seven months because I've been, you know, uh, of course, you know, as I do this as a side thing, I can't keep the schedule as it was, but like what I'm just saying is that everyone should do the same. Take a list of things you need to learn that you know that you're weak at or that you're interested in and then create sprints of three months. Three months, I'm going to focus on learning how to code a website. So every day you invest two hours of your time in doing a coding bootcamp or a code academy or whatever that is, so that by the end of those three months, you know how to code a page. Then you're going to tell yourself in next three months, I'm going to learn everything around Facebook ads, at least the basics. So I'm going to do the course. I found this course of, I don't know, Udemy for like $20 that I'm going to do every single day for three months. And plus I'm going to test it with a dummy account. Then I'm going to learn how to do uh, sales. I took, for instance, the beginning of the year, um, a sales certification by Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. You can find it at jordanbelfort.com or whatever that is. Um, man, I learned so much out of that course that the amount of learning that I got is invaluable. Because it, because it just really projects your career from here to here. Because, man, at the end of the day, you know, my advice to you is, is really simple, is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. There's people that are much smarter than yourself that have figured that thing out. So don't waste time figuring things out. Waste time actually learning how others solve that exact problem on reinventing the wheel. No, that, that's really good insights. And I just want to ask, as, as a marketeer, what do you use? What are the typical tools that you use daily? But depending on the project, but definitely Google Analytics, uh, Facebook Ads Manager, um, LinkedIn content, um, uh, front end coding, uh, CSS, JavaScript, HTML, um, some, some React, um, then you need to know how to do like scraping and automations, super important. Uh, man, there's so much because, so as a growth marketer um, and as a growth professional, growth hacker, you want to call it, basically you need to develop what is called like the T-shape. And the T-shape is basically learning um, the basics of every single thing. So I would know how to code a website but I would not know how to code like the back end and something like super, super complicated. But if you give me a product, I need to be able by myself to go live. So without going and finding a coder, without doing all that, I need to be able as a single cell to work as a single organism. So that if you give me whatever project I can do, I can do it all. I cannot do it to a hundred percent, but I can do it enough for us to make money and for us to like do, to generate revenue. Then, of course, I'm not going to do it because, because otherwise I would just be doing this all the time. Then in that case, you just recruit people. So what I just want to say about this is that the things that you need to learn, it really depends on the things that you want to specialize in. I am what's called, what I call like a T-shaped marketer where I try to really 
work on all the angles of growth marketing. So UX, UI, front end coding, analytics, um, A-B testing, um, multivariate testing, sort uh, then a little bit uh, of, uh, of uh, statistics, um, content, sales, persuasion techniques, event management, uh, all of that. Facebook ads, you know, like, like and all of these, I have a very fair understanding and fair mastery of all of it. And then the beauty of it is that once you master A, B, and C, and then you just move verticals, you can go back to D, E, F. And then that thing, you can deepen your knowledge so that, you know, it never ends. The learning process never ends because things get new, like they get updated. And plus, you can really deepen your knowledge on every single aspect of growth marketing that you're tackling. So that's why it really depends what, what people out there want to specialize in. If you want to specialize just in performance, focus on Facebook. If you want to specialize just in uh, landing page building and, uh, and sales uh, frameworks, etc., then focus on CRO, UX, UI, persuasion techniques, uh, and digital psychology. If you want to focus on analytics, then you should learn how to code Python. You should learn how to go into tools like Google Analytics, Amplitude, Mixpanel, uh, and all of that. And then you really need to decide you know, where, where, where you want to verticalize in. Where do you feel more comfortable and you want to engage more time in? That's awesome. That's awesome. Look, I think that was a really useful ad. Thank you so much for taking your, the time. You're so welcome with us uh, look, I'm, I'm fairly confident all our users will find this really useful and really I guess inspiring to hear your story as well um, I think from yeah from, from, from us and working with yourself I think we, we found it incredibly insightful and your breadth of knowledge would be really great so uh, look hopefully our users and we even uh, and we haven't even scratched the surface yet so yeah look, hopefully we'll do some more but thank you so much for your time yeah. we really appreciate it thank you I really appreciate you thank you